Hello and welcome back to the Fine Talk 2 channel. As always, joined by the fantastic co-host of the show, George, down the bottom. Welcome back. You obviously had a couple of uh, episodes off. You were busy doing life and stuff and all that kind of stuff. So you're back in casual corner now and you're wearing your trademark uh, Fine Talk beanie, which is always good to see, as is the eloquent analyst over there in the corner as well. Prath, how are we doing, man? Doing great, man. Doing great. How are you doing? Yeah, all good, man. All good. George, how are you, man? How are you? How was your week off? It was great. It's even better to be back, though. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, man. That's it. And we've got some fantastic fights to break down as well because it was a, it was an eventful slash uneventful night. You know, sometimes these nights, especially when there's some big names on the card, they've got a bit of hype around them and you never know which way they're going to go. But I, I think the main thing I want to really want to speak about is the, the Brunson Holland fight. That's the, we're, going to, we're going to kick off with the main event because a lot of people were giving him a lot of hate, Holland a lot of hate, because he was just talking throughout the whole thing. And to be honest with you, it didn't really seem like he was very interested in winning. You know, he still had a lot of energy left. And you think this is a fight that, you know, you're 10th ranked and you're fighting the number seven guy. This could propel you to then have a top five, to then be in contention for the belt. And you think, why are you not pushing more in this bout? You know, you should be finishing and being like, right, that's it. I am, I, I'm spent. Do you know what I mean? I've left everything in the octagon now, but he just, he just didn't do that. Do you know what I mean? It was just a bit of a sad sight to see for me as a fan of him as well. And a fan of, a fan of what he does and how he acts and stuff like that. But I think we're all probably going to disagree a little bit on this as well, because Prath, you said that you quite enjoyed his uh, trash talking, but how, what do you think he could have done differently to, to win that fight? I don't know if he could have actually done a lot differently. Uh, it looks like he was being very much controlled on the ground. And uh, it seems like every round kind of started the same way, which was Kevin Holland doing fairly well in the stand-up department and catching Bronson with shots and then eventually getting taken down. I think the only round that was really different to that was the first round where he slipped rather than actually getting taken down. That was the only noticeable difference I could see. But it felt like I was watching the same round five times over. Um, very, very strange. Um, I appreciate... What I was trying to say was that I just appreciate Kevin Holland's candor in, in the cage, right? He knows he's been taken down. He knows he can't get back up. And he's just having a bit of fun with it. And it is what it is. He's not getting brutally, you know, ground and pounded into the ground. So I think, like, in those circumstances, he's having a little bit of fun with it. Um, I would love to have seen some more urgency uh, in trying to get up, but it didn't seem like... he. It seemed like he was quite comfortable being taken down and, you know, being on his back and being controlled, really. Um, you know, trying to hit a couple of shots from the bottom here and there, but just not really doing anything substantial, waiting till the end of the round, going to his corner and asking Khabib for advice, not his own corner, which I, that was, that was the thing that cracked me up the most. The fact that he was missing his fourth cornerman, Khabib was sitting there, you know, he's live streaming, you know, surprised Dana White isn't admonishing him for live streaming over there, but instead, you know, Khabib decided to sit there, not give him any advice, tell him to focus on the fight. You could just see him doing like, focus on the fight, focus on the fight. And, um, I, I love his attitude. I love his attitude. Even though he's getting beaten, he knows it's not like it's not that deep. He's not getting destroyed here by Derek Bronson. I don't think he had any kind of fear of being knocked out by Derek Bronson. And I think that's why he kind of had the confidence to talk a little bit of shit there inside the cage. Um, so, yeah, it, even though it was a very much dominant performance, you know, it looks like every every judge gave one one of the rounds to, to um, Kevin Holland as well. I'm not too sure which round. I think maybe the second round where he stung him quite hard. Yeah. Um, that was maybe the only round I really saw Kevin Holland have success, but in the same, in the same respect, he was catching him with shots. I just, I just think, you know, Derek Bronson's savvy veteran uh, knows his position in the cage as well. Like I think he knows that he had Kevin Holland when he was getting uh, stung, he was had him up against the cage or near the cage. So he could push him up against there and eventually get the takedown, the single leg, you know, and he, you know, De to Derek Bronson's credit, he was, he was mixing up the takedowns. He was going from a single leg to a double leg and he's, um, you know, body lock takedowns like Barack variety in his takedowns like that's good to see that you know he can you know in most of these kind of clinch positions or takedown positions or open mat or in the cage he's he's doing well against the you know someone who's a black belt as well in jiu-jitsu and is confident off of his back so in that sense it's really good to see Derek Brunson dominate there and uh, really show his you know credentials I don't think that was anything different from a, a typical Derek Brunson fight so I don't know if I've saw anything different 
um, that will propel him forward. I think he's going to have a lot of trouble with the guys that have a little bit better takedown defense, you know, looking up at the, the, the top side of the division, you know, I think Derek Brunson is going to have a real tough time taking down like a Paolo Costa, someone that's just very strong and uh, very explosive and can, you know, fight off those takedowns a little bit better. Um, so I think, you know, this is kind of where we will see Derek Brunson here really go after the bottom half of the division and really dominate them and then really struggle with the top half of the division, struggle to take them down and then struggle to compete with them on the feet. Yeah, definitely, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he did, he looked very small in there as well. Kevin Holland, you know, I know Brunson's a big guy, big shoulders, you know, very, very big delts and stuff like that. But do you think the massive weight difference, George, uh, do you think the massive weight difference between the two gentlemen affected the fight dramatically? Do you know what I mean? Because last week we obviously saw Izzy get kind of wrestled to the ground and just kind of laid on by Jan Blahovic. But for me, Blahovic did a lot more than Brunson was trying to do on the ground. You know, he was actually trying to put the work in. But what, what do you think? Uh, do, do you think that Brunson has now laid out the game plan for how to dismantle Holland for his future bouts? Uh, not really, because I think Holland's been the same throughout. I've always thought as Kevin Holland, he's not as a guy who's just not bothered about winning the title. He's just there for a good time and to pick up money. He, he doesn't care about coming a champion, I don't think. He's just there to have a laugh like he shows he does, pick up big paychecks and walk on out of there. Now, I was disappointed in him last night, though. I thought last night was the big, big chance, you know, but Derek Brunson kind of feels like the guy you go through to kind of move yourself up to a Paolo Costa or Rob Whittaker, that kind of guy. And it was like he just wasn't bothered, really. And it was kind of disappointing because I was, you know, obviously I wasn't here for the preview show, but I had him winning. I thought it was going to be pretty spectacular from and I was expecting him to, to finish Derek Brunson and kind of get on, get on the mic and say that he wanted a, a Paolo Costa or a Rob Whittaker next. But I just... I, I sat down this morning as I was making my notes and I was thinking about, I was like, this guy actually doesn't care, does he? he doesn't, he's not bothered about winning titles. He doesn't, he's not bothered about rankings. He just is there to have a laugh, beat a few guys, which he has done. Obviously, last year was incredible. He was my fighter of the year last year. But, and there's no shame in this. There's, the UFC needs guys like this that just want to turn up, make money and go again. But I just felt like it was such a big opportunity missed last night. It was a chance to break the, break the kind of, middle road gap head for a top five and get get people worried about you as well beating a guy like Derek Brunson is no mean feat he only loses to the best Derek Brunson so it felt like a it felt like it feels so deflating it feels like such a big opportunity missed and I do wonder whether Kevin Holland will look back on this and, and regret it slightly potentially further down the line that he didn't put more effort in last night and that he didn't take it a bit more seriously but you know He'll be there. He'll come back. He'll have probably four or five more fights this year. For Derek Brunson, I suppose he moves on to... A, he might get himself a top five guy now. He might be able to demand that out of the UFC, but we'll see. But yeah, no, I was just... When I watched it last night, I found it to be a bit a bit boring, if I'm being honest. And I was... And my overriding feeling is just disappointment that Kevin Holland didn't show up a bit more. Yeah, it's, it's a shame when someone has such a spectacular year and some fantastic knockouts he had last year as well, you know. And it wasn't just last year. He's obviously got a very, very good record. I believe it's like 20 and six now it would be. Um, but he had, you know, five straight wins last year over big, decent, decent competitors as well, you know. Darren Stewart went to a split with him. Joaquin Buckley knocked him out. And it's, it is a shame to see someone like that. But... If he's not in the winning column, having his laughing and his joking and stuff like that, how much longer is he going to be around in the UFC to pick up paychecks if he's not winning? Now, one of my favorite, is one of my favorite quotes is, "If you're going to be a rebel, make sure you win." Because if you're going to be the if you're going to be the class clown, you've got to be getting straight A's as well, man. Because you're not going to be in school for much longer to be that clown persona. Do you know what I mean? So, how how much longer before he gets dropped if he's acting like this and doesn't care? Well, completely. This was the this was the first time last night as well that we saw the kind of the act not work because last year it was all it was all everyone thought it was brilliant, didn't they? Because it, it was winning fights. I mean, the the kind of the massive moment was him knocking out Jackeré in December, and everyone was like, "This is unbelievable!" You know, he's just he's just absolutely taken out a huge legend of this sport. The knockout was incredible, 
and everyone was like, this kid, this is the next guy. He could be in a title fight next year, everyone was saying, you know, and like you just said, last night was the first time really where it hasn't worked, where this kind of funny persona has fallen flat on its face and he's looked like a bit of an idiot, you know, but he's not going to change. He's not going to change one bit. He'll be back next fight doing exactly the same thing. So, you know, he'll live and die by his, by his antics for sure. Yeah. And where does he go next? You know, obviously he was ranked number 10. He'll probably keep stock and stay at number 10, for instance. But, but where does he go next and who does he fight? And, you know, who's he going to get matched up with if, he's, if he can't get through Brunson? Who's, he, who's, who's, who's in the 7 to 10 spot, 7 to 9? I, yeah. Well, I had, I had the winner of Hall against Weidman, maybe, him getting matched up with them, potentially. Yep, that was the one I kind of looked at as well. The other two kind of guys, two two guys underneath, uh, two guys underneath, you know, sandwiched in between Kevin Holland is Uriah Hall and Chris Weidman. Um, Edmund Shabazian's been matched up with Jack Hermanson, which is I don't understand that, but we 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 were okay, okay, Dana. Yeah, we'll we'll leave it on that one. Um, you know, didn't beat Derek Brunton, but we're going to put him in against a higher ranked Jack Hermanson. Unbelievable. Wait, wait, wait to to propel this kid forward. And as well, no. Yeah, uh, you know, there, there are other people here that he could fight as well. You know, there's number 13, Omari Akhmedov, number 14, Brad Tavares, number 15, Sean Strickland. These are like people that he could potentially bounce back against and, and have a big win, potentially. Um, but I think it's one of those ones where it's going to take him a long time to get on. He's going to need to get on a streak again and then fight someone in the top. I don't see him, you know, beating an Omari Akhmedov and then getting, you know, Darren Till. Or Jared Cannonier or any of these guys right at the top of the division. And I'm looking at it now. Jared Cannonier is the only one that isn't matched up. Everyone else is. Rob Whitaker is. Paolo Costa is ill. Darren Tiller is matched up against Vittori, number four and number five. Jack Manson's got Edmund Shabazian. So, you know, potentially Derek Bronson versus Jared Cannonier is, is another fight that Derek could probably take to, to maybe go forward here. But, I mean, I don't think I particularly want to see that, to be honest. He gets beat by, he gets beat by Cannonier. I think Canada smashes it, man. Yeah, Canada, Canada smashes pieces. Powerful, came down from heavyweight to light heavyweight to middleweight. Yeah. Powerful, uh, explosive. Like, I think he can negate the wrestling of Derek Bronson. I think he can hit him with big shots and put him out. It was like when it was like last night, though, when he said, I want to fight Paolo Costa. I didn't get the Paolo Costa thing either because I was like, he's probably going to smash you as well. Like, he hasn't got much apart from his heavy punches, but I just don't see. I think this is going to be like we just. Like you said, this is going to be the problem with Derek Brunson. He's going to get to a top five guy and he's going to come up short. He's always going to be in that no man's land, like kind of seven to eight spot. He's better than the people below him, but he's not as good as the people above him. And age is not on his side anymore. So he's not going to get any better now. He's kind of stuck there almost. Yeah, he'll fight Paolo Costa. He'll lose to Paolo Costa. Then he'll go to fight someone in the lower half of the division, a Uriah Hall or a yeah. you know a Chris Weidman, and just kind of ride him out for a decision. And then it would just be the same thing. They'll put him against Jared Cannonier next, and Jared beats him. Then they put him against Paolo. Paolo will beat him. They put him against Rob. Rob will beat him because these are all for me. You know, I think the top five of the middleweight division is just so so solid, man. I just I think and they're good everywhere as well. Like even Darren Till maybe necessarily isn't the best of takedown defenses, but I think he's got good enough takedown defense to stop Bronson from being able to really control him. And you know, even Darren Till, you see, he gets taken down, but he get manages to get back to his feet pretty quickly comparatively to you know any you know comparatively to a Kevin Holland who just decided to lay on his back and hold guard or triangle his legs and things like that. We won't see that out Darren Till. Darren Till will scoot to the cage, get back up and carry on fighting. Yeah. Well, at least with Darren Till, you get 100% effort. Unlike Kevin Holland, and, you know, you get, you and, get him his best, wouldn't you? And the smack talk. And the smack talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another fight I really enjoyed from yesterday was the, uh, the man that obviously... Got cut from the UFC, bam, bam, tied to Ivasa. He looked fantastic yesterday against Hunsucker, who has possibly the worst name in the UFC. Hunsucker is just a terrible name. If you were to say that to anyone that was Irish or Scottish, it would mean a very, very different thing. Um, but no, bam, bam, looked absolutely fantastic out there. And obviously, after being cut in the UFC, he's actually gone on a few wins as well. And he's looking, he's, well, he's still looking chubs. You know what I mean? The kid can still lose a bit of weight, but... I thought he looked really, really good out there. He had some really, really heavy low leg kicks. 
And you could see that Hunsucker was in a lot of pain after two or three of them, I guess. If you've got a guy that's cut into 265, smashing you in the shin, that's going to cause a bit of damage, isn't it? And it, it really did. And then Bam Bam just used his hands and went straight in. But it's, it's where do we see Tai Tuivasa going? Do you know what I mean? The heavyweight division is always synonymous with champions that have been around the 240, between 240 and 255 mark. You, you don't really get a champion that's 265 and cut into that as we've spoken about before, unless they are six foot eight and built like a brick, uh, a brick shit house. So it's, it's one of them things in it. Where does he go? Is he going to be one of these people that kind of floats around the seven to 12 div- uh, ranking and then kind of fight faces someone in the top, you know, the top five, if he was, you know, Taito Vassa versus Stipe, Lewis, Blades, Ngannou, a- a- any of these people, man, he, he's, he's, he's not going to be matched up very well with them, you know? Even someone like Aspinall. Aspinall looked phenomenal last time he was out. If you had Taito Vasa versus Aspinall, I think Aspinall pieces him up. He's too quick. He's too agile. Great groundwork as well. It, but just, but, but where do we see him going after this? What do you think? Obviously, there was something on Twitter yesterday about him facing uh, maybe like a Greg Hardy, for instance. But, Rath, where do you see him going from here? Damn, I actually kind of like that. I actually kind of like him versus Greg Hardy. Um, I was looking at the heavyweight rankings and I saw Chris Dorcas. I thought that might be a good fight for Chris Dorcas to really like elevate his name um, and potentially get a big win there. Um, Tom Aspinall is a good one as well. Another person that, you know, Ty could fight. Uh, you know, I think Ty's not really going to get very favorable matchups until he gets a couple of more wins together. I think whoever he fights next is going to be a tough fight. He's, he's going to get a Chris Dawkins. He's going to get a Tom Aspinall. He's going to get someone like an Alexi Olimic, who's got, you know, very specialist in, in the heavyweight division. Um, and then maybe he'll get like a favorable matchup. But I, do you know what? Scrap all of that. I kind of like Greg Hardy. You know, <laughs> Taito Ty- Ty- Yavasa isn't in the top 15. No. You know, Greg Hardy's not in the top 15 either. And that's another fight to then maybe see who can move on to fighting one of these top 15 guys. And then I think, you know, like a Tom Aspinall or a Chris Dorcas or a Martin Taibura is, is a good kind of fight for them to then kind of start making their run towards the top there. Um, but yeah, I like that. And good matchmaking, Connor. No, I saw it. I stole it off of Twitter, man. But I'm, I, didn't, oh. I, didn't take, I didn't take any of that. I'm not taking any credit. But a few of those guys are matched up now anyway. And people like Olenink are, you know, what is he, like 42 or something? Or 40, early 40s? The, the heavyweight division, man, it's synonymous, it's synonymous for older people, older gentlemen anyway. So a few of those guys are going to be retiring this year, I think. You know, they're going to be one or two more fights in. And then Dana can't keep these guys on that are kind of pushing 40, 43. Arlovsky, for instance, these kind of fighters. We obviously got rid of um, Junior Dos Santos and uh, Overeem back in the last... Was it the beginning of, beginning of this year, no? Yeah, it was, uh, a couple it was of weeks. like a month ago. Yeah, it was like a month ago. Yeah. My yeah, time might fall off, man. But yeah, obviously getting rid of those guys from the heavyweight division as well. It does free up a little bit of space for these kind of young guns to come through and make a bit of noise. For sure. I think... I think Arlovsky uh, is 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 criminally underrated. Like I think he's learned a style to 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 protect his chin a little bit more, and he goes in and he has competitive fights. He's losing by decision. I'm not saying he's wiping the floor of anyone, but they still need someone in the division that they can you know they can match him up against you know the people that are losing or people that are up and comers and things like that. Mm. I think Andre is good for that. I'm I'm really surprised they got rid of Overeem. Uh, more so than Junior Dos Santos, because over him, I felt like would have been like, you know, you match him up against any of the top 15 guys and that's like a guaranteed either title shot or win one more. And then you're, you're, you're right there for a title. So really, really surprised. I think JDS a little bit, I can understand, you know, in his last couple of fights, he hasn't been there kind of aggressively or technically as much as an over him over him. I feel like in his last couple of fights, he may have lost them, but he has done well enough in the sense that he is, been able to protect his chin for the most part, apart from obviously the, that doesn't count the Volkov fight where he got absolutely destroyed, but the fights before that he was doing pretty well. So I was quite surprised, um, but yeah, no, I agree. You know, I think it's time that we, we get rid of some of some of the older guys, um, but we bearing in mind that we do need to have people to be able to match up um, with up and comers so we can propel those names forward as well. Yeah, completely, completely. And do you think as well, do you think as well, just, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Bam, Bam doesn't end up in the top 15, but I think matching up against guys like Aspinall at the moment would just be unfair. You know, what Aspinall did to Arlovsky was pretty impressive. And, you know, I think he's good. 
Tuivasa, but I think he's just a few streaks behind people like Borkas and Aspinall at the moment. I think he's got a bit more learning outside of the top 15 before he kind of gets a guy like that. You know, Aspinall and Dorcas are on their way to top 10 guys quite soon. And, you know, Greg Hardy, like we've all said, I think he's a pretty good shout, to be honest. It makes a lot of sense. So, um, yeah, um, I wouldn't throw him in there with an Aspinall. I think it wouldn't go very well for him. Do you know what would be a good fight? Chris Dorcas versus Tom Aspinall. I think that would, you talk about him being matched up against other people. I'd love to see that fight. I think that fight would be really good. I think Dorcas is fighting in a couple of weeks, isn't he? Isn't he fighting Marcin Tabura? Aren't they fighting? I, I thought think. he. I thought Tabura was fighting Walt Harris. I'm not too sure, man. These fights seem to be coming around so quickly, and then it seems like <laughs> you've seen one of these guys fight two weeks ago. They're already booked back on, and they're fighting in a couple of weeks' time. And you think. The, the, the turnarounds are really, really good for some of these guys. Really, really good. Considering we're, I think it's more with the kind of the bigger names. Obviously, we only see them once, maybe twice a year, the kind of, you know, superstars. But these guys, that they're on the grind, man. They are grinding. I feel like it was only yesterday we were seeing these guys fight. And now all of a sudden we're seeing them again, you know. Like the Lidze. The one that- we, never, we never spoke about the Lidze in the pre-fight, but he was obviously cutting 20 pounds to, to get down to this, this weight category and... He didn't look very good, to be honest with you. I was really upset with the Delidze performance. Uh, I know, I remember speaking about him at the beginning of the year and it was kind of like, this guy's really good. You know, this Georgian kind of guy, he's coming in, he's looking... He, even yesterday, he looked very, very confident in what he was doing uh, and stuff like that, but he just didn't, he just, you know, he didn't show up. He didn't show up at all. George, what did you think of the fight? Because uh, you're, always, you're, you're always pretty high on these Georgian guys and these kind of, these, these fighters coming in, right? Yeah, there's a lot of Georgian guys who at the moment are kind of making a few noises. You know, uh, Ilya Taporia seems to be the biggest one down at featherweight. He seems to be the real kind of big one. But yeah, he was disappointing last night, Delizze. I have to admit, though, when I, like, I, I'm quite high on him like you are, Connor. I think he is really good. But he always strikes me as a guy, though, who's got a loss in him. Like, he isn't going to, like, work his way up and kind of win and win. And people are going to start going, like, who's going to beat this guy? He kind of feels like he's always got a bad night in him. And I thought last night was the bad night. I just didn't think he was that great, to be honest. And I thought um, I thought he deserved to lose. You know, I wasn't... I always find when, they, when these fighters lose for the first time, which I think the Lidze did for the first time last night, mm-hmm. that they kind of... These are kind of big moments in careers. You know, you've had your first loss. Now, how do you react to it? It's the kind... That's the big kind of question mark I always have. You know, you can react to it, in, you know, and take it really poorly, a.k.a a Sean O'Malley, you know, and like claim you've never lost in your life and it looks terrible. Uh, or you can just kind of accept it a bit like an Israel Adesanya and go, look, I'm going to learn from it, come back, be better for it. You know, I must admit the Lidze strikes me as, as a Sean O'Malley type. He might take it quite badly. But yeah, we'll see. I just thought, yeah, he was disappointing, but he strikes as a guy who's definitely got a few losses coming his way across his career. Yeah, and a guy that hadn't lost for, I think it was, what, like 13 years or something? Was it 13 years or 12 yeah. years? Your boy, yeah, uh, no, your boy Santos. No one uh, loser. But he took a big L yesterday, didn't he? In the, in the, I think it was the second, it was the second closest ever knockout victory or victory, like, at the end of the round, basically, like, before finishing. He, Dawson, Grant Dawson got the win on <laughs> four minutes and 59 seconds, but... You were pretty high on Santos coming in and uh, and being quite dominant in there, but Grant Dawson looked fantastic. Uh, obviously, he was just plugging the uh, leg kick and the overhand right, and then he was kind of shying away, and then he was just throwing the overhand right again. And he was just, I think, and then at some point he mixed it up and he threw the overhand right just one more time just to see what happened. <laughs> and, but in the end, it was the uh, the hammer from hell that that put Santos out. But what do you think Santos did right and what did he do wrong? Obviously, Dawson didn't look. He didn't look amazing, to be honest with you, but he he acknowledged that in the post-fight, which I appreciated. You just said that he looked awesome. Hey, okay, all right. Leo Santos looked really good. Grant Dawson. So, I think it was. I think I think it was a close fight, right? I think it was. It was a good fight as well. Um, I wouldn't say like either of them had blown each other out of the water, kind of thing, until the right at the end of the fight where Grant Dawson blew him out of the water. But um, man, it was close fight. Um, I think. 
is weird seeing like Leonardo Santos. He's had these really long breaks in between his fights, and he's come. He comes back and he's able to just put these strikes together and win. He wins by knockout half the time. He doesn't even win by submission, and he's like a very, very uh, accredited black belt. But it seems to knock everybody out, which is really awesome. And I think it was good. It was good. Um, it was a good performance by him to, until right to the end. He he was able to, you know, get out of the way of a lot of shots. He was tiring uh, Grant Dawson out. I think. Um, I think he was well on the way to winning that fight two to one. Um, and then, man, you can't underestimate those uh, those hammer fists from the top position. Um, and I think he was trying to like hold on to a leg lock. You know, it's lost a couple of seconds of the fight. So I think he just tried to like kind of hail Mary a leg lock and hope for the best kind of thing. And, you know, I think he didn't get a very good position on Grant Dawson. Grant Dawson was able to get his bearings above uh, Leonardo Santos and just kind of the 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 typical just not even like a, a technical hammer fist he just literally just like swung everything into into a downwards kind of angle and hope for the best and hit him once or twice I think he I think he knocked him out within the first like two shots he threw and then ended up throwing like maybe six shots altogether um, you know that was brutal as well you see the the mouth card get uh, come flying out of the mouth as well that's uh that was a brutal one and i think leonardo sarnes is going to definitely remember that one which sucks man um 13 years undefeated and uh was it took t- this loss tonight man and it's going to be one of those ones where it depends if he takes a really long break again i don't see him coming back you know he's in his you know, early 40s now, if he takes another year long break, I think it's really going to be one of those ones where they think he's going to come back. Um, if he's able to turn around pretty quickly, uh, come back from the knockout loss, maybe he can have a couple of more fights here. I think it's mo- momentum is your your best friend here in this kind of circumstance and scenario, especially when you're at the age of 41 or 42. I can't actually remember, but he's in his 40s. Um, so, uh, and you know, Grant Dawson, that's a great win for Grant Dawson as well. Like, it's a big win. You know, Leonardo Santos has wins over Kevin Lee and and um, Stevie Ray. You know, very, very elite guys. So, you know, that really bro- uh, boosts Grant Dawson. I think this is this is a new weight class. Doubt he was up from uh, featherweight to lightweight. Now, it looks like he carried a lot of that power over. Um, the control was quite good. You know, he was able to get Leonardo Santos up against the cage in those clinch positions. Again, one of the things I'd love to see out of all fighters is just a little bit more activity on the fence, a uh, little bit more, you know, uh, urgency to to win the fight, to to finish the fight. I find a lot of the guys tend to, you know, they they find themselves being able to hold the position. And for me, I feel like the the rules kind of favor those guys and allow them to kind of hang out in those positions. Um, I'd love to see a little bit more um, urgency or something in the rules that that has to make them be a little bit more urgent on the fence. Um, and I think apart from that, that was that was the only real massive success that Grant Dawson had outside of the obviously the winning hammer fist KO that he that he got over Leonardo Santos. Apart from that, I think Leonardo Santos was able to kind of control most of the fight. Um, so weird one. Uh, all of these those really cool last last second KOs are just super exciting. Makes it you know, and that's another thing that you makes you glue to your TV when you're watching these MMA fights. You never know what will happen, even until the last effing second, someone can get knocked the hell out, and that is exactly what happened. Uh, it sucks for Leonardo Santos now, in in the sense that that's something that he's going to have holding beholden to him now. You know, he's going to have that on his on his conscious knowing that, you know, he's got one of the very few lockout losses at the last second. You know, I think there was like, they were saying it was like one of the only ones within a three round fight uh, that close to the, uh, to the end of the fight as well. So amazing, man. Amazing fight as well. Like both guys, both guys uh, really put it out there as well. And, um, you know, that was an undercard fight. They didn't need to necessarily come out and blow, you know, the people out of the water, but I felt like that was one of the stronger fight of the nights. Definitely. And, you know, actually, two of, the, two of the judges had Dawson up 20 to, 20 to 18. Wow. I yeah, did not so know he that. was actually winning on the scorecards as well. I was really surprised he's, at that. These judges suck, man. Jesus yeah. Christ. And with regards oh. to what um, you said about, like, fouls and stuff, the, um, all the judges, did you notice that all of the judges were very, very um, aggressive? Mm informative yeah. on the uh, yeah. keeping the fingers straight and stuff like that throughout the whole night it was watch your fingers watch your fingers watch your fingers which obviously after last week and the week before all these kind of eye pokes and stuff like that and illegal uh, illegal knees and bits and pieces it was it was nice to see them come out and make a an active change you know uh, 
Bisbing said that Mark Smith, referee Mark Smith had come up to him in the broadcast and said, "We have we have act we the referees got together and they've actively said that they are going to make sure that they are doing warnings early earlier and more aggressively." And I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, they are noticing that guys, you know, because some people get away with it, you know, especially with the pouring, like I lo- like Kevin Holland style, for instance, like Kevin Holland, the first couple of seconds of the fight, he was very aggressively pouring towards uh, Derek Bronson. And the referee had to, within the first like five seconds, was like, watch your fingers. Because, you know, like that once you once you've done it once or twice, you poured away the hand once or twice, you're confident in, in that, like that's working for me. And then you tend to go for it and become over aggressive with it. And that's where the eye pokes happen. So I love, love that the referees um, have made a point to say that they're going to attack this earlier instead of letting them get one or two off and then saying, OK, well, watch your fingers now, guys. Yeah, completely, completely. Uh, someone that didn't have to use any eye pokes was... Uh... Yanez, Yanez looked absolutely fantastic last night. George, I could see you salivating down there in casual corner, man. Tell me how you tell me how you thought the, uh, you know, what was what was the good bits and the bad bits of the fight. Obviously, Lopez did not want to engage at one point. I think for about three or four minutes, he was like, right, I'm not going to do anything because whenever I do, I seem to get clipped about eight times on the way in. But for for the for the casual fan, and if you were to get so if you wanted to get someone to MMA, for instance, and you're like. You know, I want to watch an MMA fight. You're like, right, watch this guy. This guy is slick. His boxing looked fantastic last night. And you're obviously a boxing man yourself, aren't you? Yeah, this guy, this guy's striking is not developed. It's his pure born with talent that he's got, you know, and that's what makes him special, uh, Adrian Yanez. You know, when you've got guys like Teddy Atlas praising you for how good your striking is, one of the greatest trainers of all time in combat sport, um, you know that this guy is special. You know, he was going to be in Crush Corner if I was here last week. Um, he was someone that I considered for someone to look out for in 2021 as well. And I think last night he showed everyone why you should be looking out for him. He's a serious problem at 135 pounds. You know, and I've seen it a couple in the two fights and you've seen now, both times when he's found his range, the fight is over because his striking is so clean. It's so crisp and it's actually it actually comes with such force as well and you could see it last night with like you just said with Lopez once Yanez was in the fight and he found his range Lopez didn't want to be there no more he didn't he the striking was just too much for him um I said it on social media this morning he reminds me so much of Jorge Masvidal it's crazy the way he, the style and the way he fights he reminds me so much of Masvidal but this kid is special really 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 special he is I haven't seen striking like this for a long time, in my opinion. You know, he, I was thinking today, the only guy who I can compare it with it recently, who I can think of on top of my head, was, uh, was Raphael Fazeev for striking. His striking is pretty special as well. But yeah, um, yeah, watch out for this guy. He's coming. And if you're, if you're a boxing fan, for example, this is the perfect guy to sit there and watch because you can appreciate what this guy, this guy's skill level and his talent. So if you're looking to make a transition over, then for sure, look out for Adrian uh, Yanez. I wouldn't surprise me one bit as well. If this is a guy that the UFC starts a fast track, they start to look at him and go, this guy can make a bit of a run. He could find himself in the top 15. Um, I was actually going to throw out the shout that if Sean O'Malley comes through his next fight, that him and Adrian Yanez would be a good fight between the two of them. Um, But yeah, definitely keep an eye out for him. His striking is pretty insane yeah definitely man definitely another guy looked very good was uh, Montel Jackson Montel Jackson looked fantastic last night as well Brath did you manage to catch that one uh, Montel Jackson yeah yeah it was in the first round he uh, he managed to get a KO victory in the first round John Je- Jesse Strader was the guy who was fighting right yeah, I thought that was a really interesting name. I don't know why. I just remember seeing that and being like, that's a weird name. Um, but Montel Jackson uh, is a catchweight fight as well, which I thought, found really interesting. I don't know who needed the catchweight in that sense. I think it might have been the opponent. I think Montel Jackson was scheduled to fight, fight fell out, last minute replacement. Um, you know, within I think it was within two minutes as well. Very, very quick knockout. Kind of showed that he had the hand quite early on and just was able to put it on him, combinations, all that kind of stuff, man. So Montel Jackson's another one of the 135 pounds that I'm always really interested in. Um, you know, those fringe top 15 kind of bantamweight fighters that I think 
that I, I'd love to see what 15 to 20 looks like. You know, 10 to 15 is, is an absolute savagery. So I, I can imagine 15 to 20 and 15 to 25 is, is an insane uh, kind of look at the bantamweight division as well. So, you know, that's another guy I'd love to see matched up against like a Sean O'Malley, right? Sean O'Malley is someone that they want to kind of see do well. They'll try and give him slightly more favorable matchups. And then you've got people like Adrian Yanez and, and Montel Jackson that will put it on him and, and really give him competition. So, yeah, man, really interested in Montel Jackson. The great finish. Uh, I think, I don't know if he got the, did he get the bonus as well? It was uh, Yanez got the bonus. Max Griffin uh, got the bonus. Max Griffin got the bonus. Did Grod, Grod Dawson must have got the bonus though, right? Surely. That's all yeah. I think about as soon as you get the knockout. Was 50 Jews, baby, 50 Jews. <laughs> <laughs> well that's what you know good on them as well go get that 50 g's my guys honestly like the especially when you're on the lower half of the cards man you should be getting those 50 g's um uh, that 50 is uh a lot more than you'd be making you know yeah man yeah i'm really surprised they gave uh so they gave it to bruno silver over um montel jackson i thought montel jackson had the stronger i think the more impressive ko victory there bruno silver was a little bit more like grindy kind of took him down a little bit, played around with him, and then eventually got the finish. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, nice. I'm going to add. I yeah. like that. <laughs> I, I was just kind of pointing out that both of these guys are, are real up-and-comers, you know. Um, Inez and yeah. Montel Jackson are both real up-and-comers. And then, obviously, the, the best title of the night has to go to, Mon is it Montserrat? Even me, man, Mont the eloquent the, the, the eloquent analyst is going to struggle with this one. Uh, Mon yeah, I'd, I'd say Mon Montserrat. Yeah, Montserrat. We'll go with that. We'll go with that. She um, she didn't look overly amazing yesterday. But she obviously used her short, kind of stocky physique to uh, yeah, yeah, to to out grapple um, buyers. And obviously, the buyers family went back with a few tears last night, only showing up and getting their getting their fight money instead of getting the uh, the win bonuses as well. But I thought it was really nice to see her husband in her corner as well, because obviously her fight was a little bit further up on the card, and it was lovely to see that. You know, they both support each other throughout win throughout wins or losses. You know, I thought that was really nice. But my favorite part was the after the fight had finished. Obviously, they shared a few words. But with Montserrat, I don't think she knows a lot of English. Obviously, she had a translator in the in the post fight press conference and stuff like that, and in the interviews and whatever. But they must have had some sort of verbal disagreement because uh, Byers actually said meet me in the parking lot. I thought that was fantastic. They just did not want to end that fight just then. Obviously, Bias was getting very, very frustrated at the fact that she was getting taken down and just kind of sat in this kind of, I remember, it's like a scarf choke, I believe um, Bisping was calling it, which is one of her favourite weapons in our arsenal, apparently. So it, it was an okay fight, you know, it was an okay fight. I felt like the Renault versus Chazon fight was, was a lot better. I thought that was a fantastic fight between those two women. But George, what do you think of the Max Griffin fight? Oh, Christ, we're going right onto that, are we? Um, <laughs> yeah, bouncing around. Straight away. See you later. Um, yeah, Max Griffin. Max Griffin, I thought, was putting together some nice combinations. I thought Song was scoring with good leg kick, but it was that one-two punch from Griffin that slept Song, didn't it? I thought that Max Griffin, I've thought about him in the past. I feel like he's taken a bit of time to find his range. But he seemed to find it rather quickly last night, which is obviously a good sign for him. Um, but yeah, it was a vicious knockout, wasn't it? I mean, Song was was gone, wasn't he? Straight off, straight away. Um, yeah, good fight, great fight. Griffin looked a lot better than I could seem to remember him looking recently. I think he it's almost like he feels more comfortable in the inside the octagon like last night than he has done previously. Um, but I thought Song was doing okay. I thought he was kind of in, I thought he was well in the I thought he was in the fight. But yeah, that one-two combination, yeah, was good night Vienna for him. And um, I think that's now a two or three fight win streak, is it, for Griffin? Two fight win streak. So, you know, he's making, he's making, he's moving in the right direction for sure. And obviously he wasn't supposed to be on the main card, was he? It was supposed to be um, a fight that we were all very much looking forward to in uh, Riddell versus Gillespie, right? And obviously that dropped off due to COVID and then the news shortly after of... Um, Brian Ortega versus uh, Alexander the Great Volkanovski next week being pulled off of, uh, of, the, of a big card that we've got next week as well was very, very disheartening for the fans. But 
we, we had it good. We had it good at 259. Do you know what I mean? We had it really, really good. Every car, every fight on that card stayed through. And it was it was a fantastic card, top to tail. Of 15 fights, I think, we had that night. But it is a little bit frustrating that every now and again, COVID kind of creeps in and, and cuts a few of these guys down. But, George, you watched, uh, you're, you're a big fan of Cage Warriors as well, right? So we'll just uh, nip into that and talk to us a little bit about what you saw last night. And uh, I believe it's Paddy, what's his name? Paddy Pimlet. Is it Pimlet? Paddy Pimlet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paddy the Pad Paddy. Yeah, because obviously he's going to be making his transition over to the UFC very shortly, right? Unless Cage Warriors can give him a very, very substantial amount of money. Um, I know uh, Nick Pete was talking about him coming over to, to the UFC as well. But what did you what did you see last night from Cage Warriors that's notable then, man? I'd say the, the last three nights from Cage Warriors have been absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's one of the most well-run promotions outside of the UFC. And for years now, it's been, an, it's been a complete breeding ground for UFC talent. Um, there are guys in that. Paddy Pimblett is definitely one of them. Um, and there's other guys as well. Jack Cartwright is definitely one. They're all UFC ready right now. Ian Gary as well. Obviously, he's got a title fight coming up probably in June at the next Trilogy Series. But, yeah, I just wanted to say quickly that I just think that the last three nights, if people haven't seen it, that they should definitely go and check it out. It's been absolutely brilliant. The, the level of fights have been fantastic. The matchmaking is brilliant. It's one of the best outside of the UFC, I think. And there is talent. UFC like talent all over the place. You know, Paddy Pimblett's probably the most is the best example. He could have come to the UFC two or three years ago, you know, but he stayed in Cage Warriors. He's developed more and he looks, I mean, he looks so good on last night. He looked fantastic. Jack Cartwright's the guy for me though. I think he's a serious problem. He's been he's been a champ. I think he's had I think that was his second or third title defense now. And he's undefeated and he he looks like a guy who could find himself in the top 10 of the UFC within, within the next two years, easily, you know. So, the, yeah, the talent is there. And, you know, these guys, Paddy Pimblett, Jack Cartwright, Ian Gary, Jake Hadley, all these guys, you know, do not, do not be surprised if in the next 12 months they're signed to the UFC and they're competing against some pretty, pretty decent names in the UFC. You know, Cage Warriors, once again, is the perfect place to go and showcase your talent and get yourself signed to the UFC because these guys are coming, definitely. Yeah, and I think there was Rising on as well last night. Beth, did you, you manage to catch any Rising on last night? Oh, man, I, I managed to fall asleep like halfway through the Chiasson fight, man, and I was I was gutted because I'm usually better than this. I'm turning into casual George and I'm, I'm hating it. <laughs> I just want to say as well, um, like... Oh, he probably won't be watching this, but uh, Vucinic, like, congratulations to becoming, like, champion last night. I did not have him beating Morgan Cherrier. He was really quite good last night. I was not expecting that. It was a close fight, really close fight, but deserved winner. And, yeah, congratulations. You know, I'm expecting a rematch, though, over the fought in that one. Definitely, definitely. I watched that fight as well, and it was very, very close. Very good work from both fighters as well. A real chess match, trading blow for blow at, at, at times as well. And neither of them looked like they were wearing a lot of damage either. So that was, you know, it's obviously credit to both of them for having good defence and or good offence. Oh, obviously, over the next coming weeks, the Bellator is starting back up. Ryzen is going to be happening more. One is obviously still going anyway. The UFC and there's going to be more local promotions that are going to be popping up here, there and everywhere. And it's just, it's just a fantastic time to be a, an MMA fan, I think. Every weekend there's something to watch, you know. The UFC are putting on event after event after event. And obviously, we're going to break down uh, the... We're going to do our pre-fight of 260, which is obviously next weekend, uh, Stipe versus Francis Ngannou. So, until then, uh, thank you very much for joining into the uh, Fight and Talk 2 channel. If you want to find one of these Fight and Talk 2 beanies, I will stick the link in uh, in the description below. Uh, I. We're just really sending to the UK at the moment, but if you want us to send one to the US, I will have a look. Um, as we've sent one over to Brian Mad Dog, who's a good friend of the uh, good friend of the show as well. But catch us on YouTube, catch us on Spotify, Apple Music, and Google Podcasts as well. Don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and tell everyone that you know. I'm not going to do my little rehearsed uh, rehearsed bit, but you know what to do. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you next time.